thank you for listening. I hope you find my talk interesting. Can everyone hear me at the back? Hands up at the back if you can hear me. Can you hear me? That's a test to make sure if you're listening. It's not like, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so my name is Musa, and this talk is called The Power of Diversity. But before I start, I'd like to thank uh, Yagoda for inviting me and making me feel so welcome. We had a great time in Heidelberg. The fantastic team that she's got, they've been amazing. They've organized everything so well. My hotel is lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> These are the important things when you travel. Um, so this talk is called The Power of Diversity. And in recent weeks, I've had to have a careful think about what diversity means, and indeed, if diversity even matters. After all, you can have plenty of success without a diverse workforce. If we look at Pep Guardiola's FC Barcelona, arguably the best club side that football has ever seen, they won their championships with a team almost entirely drawn from one youth academy, the superb La Masia. Some of the world's most loved television shows, such as the US comedy Seinfeld, feature very little ethnic diversity, if any. These examples are from the world of entertainment, but some might argue that, regardless of your field, there is actually a benefit in having colleagues who have broadly the same background and perspective on life as you. After all, just look at the board of the social media um, site Twitter, which is comprised entirely of white people, and which has only just appointed its first female director, Marjorie Scardino, the former chief executive of Pearson, who owned the Financial Times. A lack of ethnic diversity has not visibly harmed their bottom line. We will return to Twitter very briefly. For now, though, we should frame this conversation more broadly. I think that diversity is a beautiful thing. Much of the beauty of the city of Heidelberg comes from its diversity, from the variety of its hills, streets, rivers, and valleys. We in this hall are diverse, not just in our skin color or the languages we speak, but in our ages, our tastes, what we like, what we dislike. That mixture, I think, is what gives daily life its true richness. Diversity is not just a question of race. It's also a question of sexuality, of faith, of physical ability or disability, of gender, of politics, of economics. And the ways in which our societies engage with diversity, or not, as the case may be, have very dramatic effects, if not altogether dangerous ones, for millions of our citizens. Let's start by looking at the diversity of our workforce. And I will tell you a quick story. When I was at law school, I met someone who would go on to become one of my best friends. Although he was a whole year younger than the rest of us, he was one of the best students on the entire course. It turned out his true passion was actually science, and that he was one of the most gifted scientists his school had ever seen. Sadly though, there was so little money available for research positions that my friend instead chose the financial security of a legal career. He is now off in Hong Kong, working for one of the biggest law firms there, and making a lot more money than me. But I think, if our government had only celebrated the diversity of our workforce, if only our government had understood the value of investing in scientific research as much as it understands the value of promoting big business, my friend might be in a laboratory somewhere, producing some of our country's latest and greatest scientific innovation. And that, to me, is a failure of diversity. Let's continue by looking at the diversity of ethnicity. At the turn of this year, the UK was braced for the invasion of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of immigrants. The media had been warning the public that, with citizens of Romania and Bulgaria free to work anywhere in the EU from the start of 2014, Britain would be overrun by a flood of job seekers from these two countries. However, 
the 1st of January came and went without any sign of the expected flood. Dr. Michaela Mihai, speaking to The Guardian later that month, told the newspaper that the wave of anti-Romanian rhetoric has made me increasingly weary of answering the question, where are you from? For the first time in my 10 years outside my home country, I am becoming painfully aware of my nationality. And the sad truth is that few media outlets in this country are doing anything to counter the fear-mongering that makes life difficult for the many who have been contributing to this country's economy. What bothers me is that these inflammatory discourses stifle an honest debate and that facts are more often than not set to the side. One of the main concerns raised by UK politicians, shamefully, and media alike, was that Romanians and Bulgarians would flock to the UK in a time of economic hardship and place a strain on the country's already damaged resources. Dr. Mihai also addressed these issues, stating that, according to the Centre for Research and Analysis of Migration at University College London, after 1999, immigrants in the UK were 45% less likely to receive state benefits than native Brits. They were also 3% less likely to live in social housing. According to the EU Commission, the unemployment rate among immigrants is lower than among Brits. As Dr. Mihai asked in conclusion, when will facts, rather than fear-mongering, begin to dominate the public debate in this country? At a time when far-right political movements are showing their teeth all over Europe, in Hungary and in Greece, Dr. Mihai's question was particularly pertinent. Whilst the UK's far-right component is far less influential than either of those organisations or countries, Golden Dawn or Jobbik, the anti-immigration rhetoric in our country's political discourse has often been poisonous. Last autumn, our government's Home Office sent vans around areas of London carrying advertisements threatening undocumented immigrants with arrest or deportation. These vans were swiftly withdrawn after widespread public ridicule, but they were far from only the UK's show of political xenophobia. Earlier that year, a member of the UK Independence Party, or UKIP, had criticised foreign aid to Africa using racially offensive language referring to the continent as Bongo Bongo Land, the stuff of crude colonial stereotypes. These actions and conversations are not merely troubling and offensive. If they were, they could be more easily dismissed. More than that, they are dangerous because they attract a disproportionate amount of our public debate. If there were a more diverse range of opinions on immigration, we would hopefully have a more diverse range a better discussion of the financial burdens that our country could reasonably bear from the arrival of EU citizens. Yet, as it is, we are not having many discussions, we are only having one discussion. We are talking about imaginary armies of foreigners swarming the UK, stealing jobs from the country's people. We find a similar distortion of debate when the UK's politicians and media discuss our welfare state. The welfare state was first seen as a safety net for those who were out of work or struggling financially. It had faced sustained criticism in recent years. Perhaps the loudest noise has been the system is being overwhelmingly exploited by those who do not wish to work, including people with disabilities. However, this argument is again not supported by the facts. Only recently, it was found that 40% of disabled people in the UK who had applied for government support had been wrongly turned down, 40%. Moreover, in January 2013, Aditya Chakraborty wrote in The Guardian that, a recent study of 6,600 national newspaper articles on welfare, published between 1995 and 2011, found that 29% of these articles referred to benefit fraud. The government's own estimate of fraud is that it is less than 1% across all benefit cases. Given our media's criticism of Romanians and Bulgarians who were apparently coming to the UK for an easier life, there was a telling and ironic detail elsewhere in Chakraborty's article, provided by the Swedish political scientist Joachim Palm. 
If you look at unemployment and sickness benefit as a proportion of average earnings, observed Palm, then Britain has one of the meanest welfare systems in Europe. Worse than Greece, worse than Bulgaria, worse than Romania. From what you can see then, our politicians and our media do not have a very favorable view of Romanians, Bulgarians, poor people, and disabled people. And I think that is because if you look at our mainstream media and our government, you will not find many Romanians, Bulgarians, poor people, or disabled people. Indeed, in the UK, in our society that rightly prides itself on its diversity, you will find surprisingly little diversity among those who occupy its positions of leadership. These are worrying times in the UK. We are currently faced with an array of challenges as severe and as complex as we have seen for generations. Yet we are governed by a group of people from almost as narrow an ideological perspective as could be imagined. This narrowness is of concern for two reasons. The first reason is economic. The financial crash of 2008, as we all now know, was due to structural flaws in our banking sector, which kept our markets unaware of our vast unpayable debts until it was too late. However, with our successive governments, both left and right, unwilling to undertake the comprehensive regulation of the city's banks and ratings agencies, many of those conditions which caused that financial crash are still in place. And this could all happen again. The second reason is ecological. Our government's current environment secretary, Owen Patterson, questioned early last year whether the planet's temperature is being influenced by man-made activity. This was directly at odds with the analysis of the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, which considered that it was at least 90% certain that human activity was responsible for most of the temperature increase observed since the 1950s. The IPCC has since upgraded that certainty to 95%. And so, while a group of the world's leading scientists think it is extremely likely that human beings have accelerated the rate of climate change, our most senior environmental politician is still unsure. His behavior is the equivalent of standing on the deck of the Titanic and doubting the size of the approaching iceberg. While he holds onto the railings and fails to act, we may be, like the Titanic, heading towards an ecological crash. This talk I'm giving today is called The Power of Diversity, but it could just usefully have been called The Peril of Uniformity. We currently have a policy of austerity being imposed by a government whose members, for the most part, have never experienced economic deprivation or hardship. Lacking a diverse worldview, they are unable to see the effects of the policies, and the result of these policies is a form of warfare. When people talk of war, the first image they think of is often a battlefield thousands of miles away, greeted by the steady rainfall of bombs. But there are other, more subtle wars taking place every day, which can be brutal in their effects on any given individual. One of these wars, which has become particularly vicious in this time of global economic discontent, is the war on empathy. The war on empathy, waged by politicians who lack the imagination or the sensitivity to think of compassionate solutions to the world's problems, dictates that every time society suffers as a whole, a smaller and defenceless group must be identified by rhetoric or policy as the culprit. The war on empathy dictates, for example, the lack of jobs is not because of the financial crash or the automation, the handing over to robots of many occupations, but is instead the fault of immigrants. The war on empathy is waged by soldiers who lack any emotional or social connection with people whose monthly wages have fallen far behind the rate of inflation and the cost of living. The war on empathy is waged by soldiers who look contemptuously upon those who have not attained their own standards of affluence or social status and punish them for it. The war on empathy 
commits acts of structural violence against its targets. And I believe it is the most dangerous bombless war that you will ever see. Of course, it is one thing for me to identify problems, but quite another for me to advance solutions. I believe, though, that diversity is the answer to winning this war. What we need in our media and in our politics are a range of voices, old, young, affluent, poor, abled, disabled, white, black, Jewish, Turkish, all the rest of it, who tell these stories of those who are currently being marginalized and therefore suffering politically as a result. One website which has sought to address this issue is Writers of Color, who last week ran a social media campaign with the hashtag all white front pages. The campaign, they explained, aimed to raise awareness of British media's need to include ethnic minority groups in their stories. Frequently, every image featured on the front page of the national newspapers is of a white person, despite the diversity of the UK's population. And when the UK, does meet, when the UK media does cover stories of people from diverse backgrounds and class, the stories are often negative, reinforcing stereotypes. Yet we are not all stereotypes. Writers of Colour has made a dramatic and important arrival, I believe, in the world of online social commentary. And, though it has attracted significant controversy in recent months, I believe that its mission is ultimately a vital one. To close, we are also seeing encouraging signs in the areas of feminism and LGBT rights, where in the last few years, we have seen the emergence of a series of excellent commentators. In 2011, Juliet Jakes, a friend, respected football writer and cultural critic, wrote an unprecedented series of essays for The Guardian about her gender reassignment process, which met tremendous acclaim. More recently, Rennie Edo Lodge and her colleagues at the Black Feminist website have successfully introduced the concept of intersectionality into mainstream UK feminist discourse. In doing so, they have drawn attention to the various issues that affect people who belong to more than one marginalised group and therefore face several societal prejudices, say homophobia, racism and misogyny, all at once. Social media has been key to many of these positive changes, providing those groups previously unheard or ignored with a channel to state their case. Twitter, as I mentioned before, has been vital to the work of activists around the globe. In the UK, Twitter has given us accounts such as everyday sexism, which, as its name suggests, lists examples of sexism that occur in everyday life, allowing women worldwide to share stories of harassment or intimidation. Twitter itself is learning to respect diversity, if only the hard way. Recently, it was forced into changing its block function, since its changes proposed were in danger of leading to the increased online harassment of women. As a closing statement, I would say that this progress is crucial because it feels we are at a point in history, economic, ecological, social, where so many of the old certainties are suddenly not so certain. Many of our once trusted public institutions, parliament, the police, our media, have experienced a series of scandals resulting in widespread revulsion. Finally, it seems the UK's public are becoming convinced that the extreme weather events we have seen of late may indeed be linked to man-made climate change. It feels to me as though we are in a position to renegotiate many of the societal terms on which we are currently living our lives. And there is no better time, I believe, than now for a range of new verses, could be me, you, any of you, to help to shape and inform the road ahead. The power of diversity in our current climate is that it can offer the hope of a more representative political discourse with fresh approaches to long-standing problems. And just maybe the power of diversity can offer a far better future for us all. Thank you.